I want to start by talking about a fictional character named Tom. Tom might be relatable to you, he might not. Just for a moment, imagine Tom. He's leaning in over his computer screen, over his keyboard. His fingers are slamming down on that keyboard or keypad. His brow is furrowed. He's muttering. You can feel his blood pressure rising. He says, I can't believe Sam believes this junk. He forcefully types his response to Sam's most recent Facebook post. This post, in his opinion, is a biased, misinformed, poorly written article from a bad source. And he is about to unequivocally show him the error of his ways. <laughs> Tom has been watching Sam for months now, post things, post articles, post things he just disagrees with that are completely opposite of what Tom believes to be true. And at first, Tom was gentle and gracious and well-reasoned and thought out. It was seen to do no good. And so he's continued to reply to Sam, and his, his replies are getting more and more aggressive. Sam is Tom's political nemesis. His political nemesis. Do any of us have political nemesis in our families or our Facebook friends or our neighbors or our classmates. Tom finishes writing his response. Just to be clear, he does the last line in all caps. <laughs> it's all caps always help. And as his finger is about to click the send button, he feels a tug on his heart. Is this how we're supposed to engage? Should I be this angry? What does God want in all of this? Tom just sort of brushes all those things aside and clicks send. Ah, vindication. Maybe you can relate, maybe not. Maybe you've never walked that path. Congratulations, <laughs> good for you. Maybe you've walked that path in a different way through a conversation, right? Where you thought things were going okay and then just red line. And how is it that politics, right? Last week we talked about faith, not fear, and how politics seem to stroke our fear, our, our, our amygdala, our, our lizard brains. How is it that politics have such an effect on us? How do we get here? <laughs> is this their fault? Right? We all assume that it's their fault for getting us this upset. Or is something going on inside of us? I really like this verse in the book of Proverbs, because I, I think it sheds light on, on this, that, that what goes into our hearts affects what comes out of our hearts. Proverbs 4.23, and this is in your slides if you have them, it says this, above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from your heart. Some have called the, the heart the control center. It's our core. It impacts what we do, why we do it. And politics, especially partisanship, so party politics, Republican, Democrat, whatever side choosing, it has a way of weaseling into our hearts. And so the anger that Tom is expressing, putting out into the world, is actually not Sam's doing. It's an overflow of Tom's heart. And see, the things we put into our heart matter, doesn't it? The news, the media, the radio, the websites, the podcasts, the articles, the opinions that we put in shapes what comes out. Politics affect our hearts. Politics affect our hearts. And we saw that, right? Fear begets fear. Fear begets fear. Fear can't produce love or even faith. Maybe the right kind of fear, fear in God. But we as Christians are called to engage by faith, right? As demonstrated through something called faithful presence. We're faithful to Jesus and we're present 
where he has us, not trying to fight back, not fleeing, not fusing, faithful and present, inviting God to work in our hearts and to flow through us, his grace, his love, his mercy. And this is hard. Politics affects our hearts. A lawyer once asked Jesus, like, what is the greatest commandment? He said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? In other words, like, what's, what's the number one way to obey God, to trust God, to please God? Right? It's, this is a question about the heart. Right? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest, this is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, the core of who you are. It's not just emotions, it's the seat of emotions. It's the, the seat of our will. It's where everything stems from. Love God completely with everything you are. That's our starting point as believers, as Christians, for how we engage in the world. Jesus is quoting an Old Testament passage. Maybe some of you know that this is from the book of Deuteronomy. It's called the Shema. The Shema. The Shema was a prayer that God taught the Israelites when he brought them out of captivity in Egypt. He brought them out of spiritual, religious, political sort of exile. They were in Egypt. God rescued them. And this is how the Shema starts. It says this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. See what God wants to be on our hearts? Love for him. Love for him. God wants us to put love for him into our hearts, develop it, foster it, seek it. And many Israelites actually prayed this prayer twice a day. And many still do. Many Jewish people still do. Once in the morning and once in the evening. So when they got up and they went to bed, right, fostering that love for God in their hearts. Tim Mackey, uh, Old Testament scholar, calls uh, the Shema a Jewish pledge of allegiance and a hymn of praise. A Jewish pledge of allegiance and a hymn of praise. It was both a worship song and a statement, a geo sort of political I trust in God. We trust in God. Our people, we trust in God. We're going to let God define us. A love for God be the thing that is our beginning point. And so as we think about the Shema, I think it's a pretty good way for us as Christians, and Jesus said it's the greatest commandment, it's a pretty good way for us as Christians to define our allegiance, to define how we engage in this world. And it actually starts with love, not fear, love. We're called to love God before politics. <laughs> Maybe that seems pretty obvious <laughs> to you, love God before politics. But I think it might be a little trickier than we realize. The Shema was the a reminder that the greatest thing God wants is our hearts, <laughs> which our hearts are all, all of us, like the core of who we are, saturating outwards. And what we do with our hearts matters for how we engage in the world. What we put into our hearts actually shapes our love for God. So it's quite possible that your politics and my politics are actually shaping your love for God. Shaping who we think God is. Shaping what we think God wants in our world. And it's quite easy for this to, to keep tumbling over and over and over again. And so that suddenly our vision of who God is, uh, who, who, who we believe, sort of our, our politics... What we, what we believe about our politics begin to shape our hearts. And I want to focus on that for a minute, but before I do, I want to say this. 
if you're feeling frustrated with the things going on in our world, if you're feeling frustrated by politics, the answer to not put more of those things into our hearts, <laughs> to put God's love into our hearts, to stop to commune with God, not to flee or run away, but to, to be intentional about fostering a love for God in our hearts. Sometimes that requires solitude, time of prayer. It's one of the reasons we come together as a church family regularly is to foster a love for God first in our hearts. This is meant to be a protective event in some ways, right? Who do we love? What do we love? And it's good. To be a part of a church family that has different understandings of things like politics and yet is united in its love for Jesus, right? Because it helps reorient our hearts to Christ to be gracious to one another. Love for God is our foundation for all things, especially how we engage in the world. As part of my doctorate of ministry studies, I read one author who showed that at different times in people's life, their politics shape their faith and what they believe about God. Just pause and think about that for a moment. There are times in my life where I actually might be determining beliefs about God, not from the Bible, <laughs> not from teachings of the church, not from prayer, but from politics, from those things, those news, those podcasts, those pundits, those opinion people, those politicians that I'm putting into my heart, those things can actually begin to shape my convictions. That's scary. In fact, most people, well, I don't want to say most people, but uh, a good sampling of people choose to be a part of a political party first before choosing their faith. Right? So we actually come to our political convictions often earlier in life when we choose to join a church. And if you join one party, you might have a greater likelihood of going to church. And if you join the other, you might not end up there at all. I don't think it should be this way. In fact, in churches, this can actually create something called a political echo chamber. <laughs> Or if the same kinds of people with the same philosophies on politics enter into one space, begin to affirm each other. And that can actually create hostility towards those who hold different opinions. So that those people that hold different political opinions don't feel comfortable entering into this space. So suddenly, we begin to look and think and act all alike in the church body. We begin to prioritize and perhaps lift up secondary beliefs that aren't intrinsic to the gospel. And that begins to shape our church community. Not a love for God, a love for being right. A love for agreement. All about the same things. Whew. I don't want politics to shape my love for God. I don't want politics to shape our church community. If anything, I want our church, our, our understanding of God, our love for him to shape how we engage in the world. The greatest commandment isn't just about loving God, though. Right? Well, the greatest commandment is, but the second greatest, the one that Jesus paired with it, is about loving your neighbor. And actually, a way to see, like, are my politics shaping my love for God? Is to say, well, how, how well do I love my neighbor? <laughs> How do I see myself interacting and engaging with my neighbor? Because I believe politics actually shape who we're even willing to consider as our neighbor, right? Kind of pushes them into this other category of enemies. That's not healthy. And so politics affect our hearts. So we seek to love God before politics. And then we seek to love our neighbors before ourselves, love our neighbors before ourselves. So, Remember, this lawyer asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus kind of threw in this other one. It's interesting that he didn't just answer with the Shema. It's like the second greatest, this is really important too, is to love your neighbor. And this actually comes from that Old Testament uh, sort of package deal, the Pentateuch, those first five books of the Bible. 
This comes from the book of Leviticus 19, verse 18 says this, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge. It doesn't sound like politics. Or bear a grudge <laughs> against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now this law comes right at the end of a series of commandments about how to live in community. Now we know from reading the scripture, from reading the the Bible, like this is talking to Israel, right, and how to kind of function in their community, but there were people that believed in God in that community and people who went through the motions, right? People who didn't. And so this is, this is about how to live in a community. So this is first for us as a church, right? We're to love one another, to love our neighbor within the church body, but then we're also to love our neighbors outside the church body. Do we really love those we disagree with politically? <laughs> what does it even mean to love them? Tom, let's go back to Tom. Funny enough, given a couple days, he wishes he did not click send. <laughs> he wishes he did not click send because immediately some of Sam's Facebook friends come out of the woodwork and they begin to jump on Tom. They begin to attack him and to criticize and to post lots of posts, and to not just disagree with him thoughtfully, but viciously, to, to attack him as a person. And Tom feels you know, pretty tender, pretty sensitive, pretty upset about this. You know, he knows that there are other good Christians on Facebook. His pastor posts all the time. <laughs> pastor is not stepping into this conversation, and neither are any of his elders or church friends, people he loves and cares about, who he expects to just maybe advocate for him in a time of need, aren't speaking up. He gets so discouraged and just feels so personally attacked that he begins to think about deactivating his Facebook account. And then something unexpected happens. Sam finally responds to Tom's comment. But he takes a much different tone than everyone else. Tells everyone, to, hey, stop it. <laughs> stop attacking Tom. He admits that they have genuine ideological disagreements, differences. But he doesn't want anyone attacking Tom personally. This is very surprising to Tom. Because <laughs> he was, you know, using all caps against Sam. Sam apologizes to Tom sends him a message and says, hey, let's go out to coffee. Let's talk about our disagreement face-to-face -face in person. I'll go for a walk on the rail trail. <laughs> and so they do. They get together. They ask questions. They have a conversation. There is no talking in all caps. Together they leave as oh, frenemies. Is that the right word? Friends. They disagree. They're united in love. There's another passage in the New Testament where a lawyer asks Jesus pretty much the same thing, and I'm not sure it's the same event or a different event. And they talk about loving God and then loving neighbor. And the lawyer asks, well, who is my neighbor? See, he's trying to justify himself. He's trying to sort of narrow down those people that he has to love. Narrow down those people that he has to respect and be kind to. It's so much easier when we don't have to love those we disagree with. And in response, Jesus tells him this story, the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, 30-37 says this, Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set, on him his, then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. 
The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He, the lawyer, said, The one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, You go and do likewise. See, the lawyer tries to justify how he loves God and how he loves his neighbor. And Jesus tells him a story that just completely like, flips that on its head. Right? You don't really love God the way God wants to be loved. You don't really love your neighbor. You've narrowed down your neighbors to those that it's easy to love. See, he, the, the lawyer would have had an easy time you know, loving the, the fellow Jew who was on the road, right? If he had been there, he probably would have taken care of him. It would have been easy to love the priest or the Levite. These are noble, respectable uh, citizens who are engaged in the public square or have spiritual leadership capabilities. But to love a Samaritan is, well, that's pretty hard. Jesus' own disciples tried to call down fire from heaven on a Samaritan village that rejected Jesus. Why is this? It's because Assyria, several hundred years before, came and exiled the, the people of northern Israel, of kind of that region, brought in foreigners to sort of like mix up their theology, mix up their community. And it worked. <laughs> they actually built their own temple and sort of had this, their own hybrid pagan religion. And the, the Jewish people did not like that, did not like them. Well, they were put in their nation at risk by idolatry and disobeying God and they actually went and destroyed the temple in Samaria. <laughs> it's a great way to make friends, right? Destroy each other's temples. This lawyer so dislikes the Samaritan that he won't even call him by his name. He doesn't say the Samaritan. He says the one who showed him mercy. Yet that Samaritan is an example for us of how we're to love our neighbor. When others attack, we come and show mercy and grace. When others wound, we bring healing and compassion. When others rob and take, we give generously and sacrificially. This is the politics of Jesus. When Satan accuses us, you and me, what does Jesus do? He defends us with his blood and his body, his perfect life lived as a sacrifice for you and for me. Where the world is wounded and broken in sin, Jesus comes and binds and heals. Right? He, he heals the blind. He heals the lame. He forgives those who have fallen into sin. And where robbers take and steal, Jesus gave everything he had. He gave up the kind of the, 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 the glories of heaven to step down into an earthly body and to live among us. Jesus is the perfect good Samaritan. See, the Good Samaritan put his life at risk to take care of that Jewish man. He put his life on the line. He could have been attacked by robbers. And then he went to the innkeeper and he gave uh, sort of this credit line, this unlimited credit line. Just spend as much as you, you need on this person. That could be very dangerous in that culture. That's what Jesus does. He risks himself. He went to the cross for us. He took on our debt so that we could be debt free. Jesus loved his enemies, made them his friends. That's what Jesus invites us to do, to walk that same road, to love God, to love our neighbor. Even those neighbors who don't feel like neighbors are our Sam's, our political nemesis. Have you thought of a political nemesis yet? Online or in your family or maybe even sitting right here. God calls you to love them. This takes our definition of neighbor and expands it way past our comfort zone. Maybe you were thinking... We're going to talk about voting, right? Loving God, loving your neighbors. Voting is one way to love your neighbor. I agree. It is. 
It can be. Voting can be one way to love your neighbor, right? But a lot of it comes down to posture, right? I'm going to do what's good for my neighbor. <laughs> they're going to they're going to get that spoonful of sugar. <laughs> I'm going to open up their mouth and put it in. Doesn't sound super loving to me. But it can be a way to bring God's goodness and flourishing to our world, to our communities. I know one way is to how we engage individually as people, as persons, right? We can make a huge difference on our roads that we're walking. And as we witness people who have been beat up by the world because of their politics or because of the way they engage, we can be like Sam, the Samaritan, show love and kindness, even if we disagree with them in genuine ways. The, the, the Samaritan got proximate. I love that word, proximate. It's a Brian Stephen word, Stevenson. How can we get closer to those either in need or we disagree with? Politics affects our hearts, so we love God. We love our neighbors before ourselves. And ultimately, maybe you've heard this already sort of in the things I've been saying, we love our enemies. <laughs> we love our political, social, ideological enemies because that's what Jesus does for us. Remember that political manifesto, the Sermon on the Mount that we talked about last week? Well, in that, Jesus says this. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. I think that could be like a tagline for some of the, the media that we can consume, right? <laughs> love your neighbor, hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Pray for them. How often when we get frustrated about something that we watch or see personally or nationally, do we just like stop and pray? This, this verse, love your enemies and pray for them, pray for those who persecute you. It was like the, the, the John three sixteen of the early church. All right. So if you look at some of the early church fathers, they quote this passage over and over and over again, Right. Now think about their context, Roman Colosseum, <laughs> lions and tigers and bears, oh my, being burned alive at the stake. They just kept saying this message, love your enemies, pray for them. Most of us are not going to have to experience that. <laughs> you know, we can find it even harder to love our enemies. I like this quote from this author. It says, Our ideological opponents are not enemies to be destroyed. They are peers to be persuaded. It reminds me of Abraham Lincoln's retort to an older woman who was criticizing him for being too soft. She felt that Lincoln wasn't using strong enough rhetoric about the Confederate Southerners, whom she considered irreconcilable enemies who must be destroyed. Lincoln calmly replied, Why, madam? Do I not destroy my enemies when I make them my friends? How many of us have seen our ideological opponents, our, our frenemies, our, our political nemesis as enemies? We talked about this verse in Christian Ed this morning, Ephesians 6.12. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Socialists, they are not our enemies. They are people made in the image of God, worthy of dignity and respect. They might be lost spiritually, and so we need to remember that our real enemy is not them, but Satan. Sin, death. Jesus came to rescue them. Jesus came to rescue us. Before Jesus rescued us, we were God's enemies. And yet Jesus delivered us. So let's see our enemies through the lens of compassion and mercy and grace. Pray that they would come to know Christ. And how we treat them, how we interact with them, may have a big influence on their story. 
So we love God and neighbor, even enemies, because Jesus first loved us. Right? Jesus loved us and showed us compassion and kindness and grace. And so that's what we turn around and we extend to our world. Now, in our own power, we are probably not going to succeed. <laughs> right? All right, I'm going to go out. And I'm going to be really good. I'm going to love God. I'm going to love my enemies. I'm going to do it. 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 <laughs> right? We need God through his Holy Spirit coming and empowering us and living through us. So maybe we need to pray for ourselves, our, our own worst enemies. But Jesus, would you live through me? Would your Holy Spirit empower me to, to love God, to love my neighbor, even my political enemy? We love God and neighbor, even enemies, because Jesus first loved us. Close with this sort of ending story, ending illustration. Uh, that I just thought was pretty good. There's a story of a Baptist pastor uh, during the American Revolution. This pastor's name was Peter Miller. He lived in Ephrata. I don't know if I'm saying that. Ephrata, Pennsylvania? Ephrata? Is that right, Andy? Okay. <laughs> if, you know, if you need to know how to pronounce a word, just ask Andy. Uh, except for that word. And one of his dearest friends was General George Washington. Maybe you've heard of him. In the town of Ephrata, there also lived a spiteful troublemaker named Michael Whitman, who did all that he could, could do to oppose and humiliate Mr. Miller. One day, Michael Whitman was arrested for treason and sentenced to death. And when he heard the news, Pastor Peter Miller set out to Philadelphia to plead for the life of his enemy. After walking 70 miles on foot, Miller petitioned his friend, George Washington, to spare Whitman's life. No, Peter, General Washington said, I cannot grant you the life of your friend. My friend, exclaimed the old preacher, he's not my friend. In fact, he is the bitterest enemy I have. What? cried Washington. I bet he said it just like that. What? You've walked 70 miles to save the life of an enemy? That puts the matter in a different light. I'll grant your pardon. And he did. And that day, Peter, Michael, Peter Miller and Michael Whitman walked back home together. And when they arrived home, they were no longer enemies. They were friends. Do we love God and our neighbors, even our enemies, our political enemies? Because Jesus first loved us. He walked those 70 miles all the way to the cross. Allegorical 70 miles. Right? He spoke up for our lives. So we speak up for others. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Help us to love you, commune with you, to seek you with all of our hearts, to know you first and foremost so that this love for neighbor this love for enemy flows out of who we are in you. And would you, through the power of your Holy Spirit, help us love our neighbors, those we agree with politically, those we disagree with politically. Help us show compassion and grace to our enemies. That's what you've done for us. Draw us into your presence and draw us closer together as a community as we worship you now. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to my third sermon, Love God and Neighbor, from my sermon series, Faith and Flourishing in Politics. I hope you'll come back next week for my fourth message, Oh, Other People's Good, where I'll talk about Shalom, the common good, and the prophet Jeremiah. All right, please like this video, subscribe to this channel, share this video, share this series. However God leads, God bless.